If you've been following along with us, you know we're in the middle of a five-part sermon series uh, on what are often called the five solas or the five sole of the Protestant Reformation. A little more than 500 years ago, Martin Luther and others attempted to reform the church and call it back to a clear presentation of the gospel. And the disagreement at that time was about how any sinner could be justified or accepted as righteous by a holy God? That was the question. And the word sola is a Latin word that just, it means alone. And the reformers insisted that sinners are justified by grace alone, on the basis of Christ's blood and righteousness alone, through the means of faith alone, for the ultimate glory of God alone as revealed with final authority in the scripture alone. So all five of these solas describe how God works to justify or declare righteous sinners and change us from being enemies of God into having a loving relationship with him. And so these truths are critical to a proper understanding of the gospel. A few weeks ago, we looked at sola scriptura, which is Latin for scripture alone, and it just means that the Bible alone is our ultimate authority for faith and life. Then last time, we looked at sola fide, which is Latin for faith alone, and this means that we're justified in God's sight, not by any works, but simply by faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. Now this week, we'll focus on sola gratia, which is Latin for grace alone, and it means that we are justified purely by God's grace and not anything that comes from us. The next time, we'll look at solus Christus, Christ alone, and that means that Jesus alone is the sole mediator between sinners and God. And then finally, we'll end with soli Deo Gloria, which means to the glory of God alone. Our salvation is to the glory of God alone. So these doctrines mark out the fundamental differences between a Catholic understanding of the gospel and a Protestant understanding of what the gospel is. These were the main points of clarification that the Reformers were preaching. But our goal this morning isn't really to learn more about the Reformation. Our goal this morning is to leave here today with a better understanding of the gospel. And sadly, many Protestant churches now are just as guilty of neglecting, misunderstanding, and distorting these truths uh, as well. And so these teachings, why emphasize this? These teachings call us back to a biblical view of salvation. And so they're helpful for us today as well. And so as I said, today we're going to be looking at sola gratia, grace alone. As I said, this means we're justified not as the result of anything in us, but by God's grace alone. Sinners are justified by grace through faith. Faith, however, is not the natural response of a sinful heart. So whatever faith, love, or repentance we find in our hearts, we owe that to the grace of God. That's what the Reformers pointed out that the Bible teaches. So in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Ephesians about the blessings that believers have in Christ. And he says in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And then he lays out some details of that blessing and how he desires for the Ephesians to understand these things. He's praying for that. But then in the beginning of chapter 2, he circles back to explain how and why they received these blessings. And that's where we're going to focus today, the beginning of chapter 2. Please turn with me if you have your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll begin at verse 1. And you were dead in, the trespass, in, in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Bible is clear that we're saved by grace. In fact, I don't know of any church or professing church that denies that we're saved by grace in in some sense. They do not, however, all understand this the same way. Many, like the Catholic Church, which where the issue, the debate began, teach that what this means is that God cooperates with the sinner, providing grace to help them do what they could not do on their own. And that leads to salvation. They teach that it is a type of helping grace. Like how rain and sunshine help a seed to grow. The Bible, however, teaches that salvation from start to finish is an undeserved gift from God. And that any spiritual ability that a sinner possesses comes not from their own heart or their own will, but purely from God's grace. So rather than a helping grace, it's a transforming grace. Rather than being like the effect of sunlight and rain on a seed, it would be more like changing a stone so that it would sprout fruit when exposed to light and rain. This is a critical difference. It's a massive difference. And to misunderstand the nature of grace is to misunderstand the gospel itself. All professing Christians believe that an act of God's grace is somehow necessary for salvation. But the Bible teaches that sinners are saved by grace alone. In pointing to the Bible's teaching on grace, the Reformers recovered the clarity of the gospel. Let's take a look. Verse 1, Ephesians 2, 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul says we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked. We followed the course of the world, which means that we were following, being moved along by dark spiritual powers that are opposed to God. We were like spiritual zombies, the living dead, unfeeling, insensitive corpses, plodding along with no life in us. We were surviving, but we were not living. We were spiritually dead. You see, we tend to think of sin as some sort of weakness in our spiritual lives. We think of ourselves as basically pretty good and we've got this sin problem that we need to deal with. We speak of it as though it's some sort of sickness of some kind, an infection into an otherwise healthy soul. But Paul paints a very different picture of unbelievers. Spiritual medicine will not help those without Christ. 
the means of grace, will not help those without Christ. Spiritual medicine cannot make us better on its own because guess what happens if you give medicine to a dead person? Nothing happens. And that's what Paul is saying. Sinners are not spiritually sick. They are spiritually dead. Paul uses this illustration of deadness to show us our complete inability to overcome sin. Paul wants us to understand that the condition of every person apart from faith in Jesus Christ is spiritual deadness, complete deadness. When a person is dead, they're completely without energy, completely insensitive, completely unable to do anything, completely under the control of somebody else. Paul wants us to understand that was us. There was no righteousness inside of us that just needed some help. Before receiving God's grace, we were being controlled, Paul says, by the prince of the power of the air, who is the same one who's at work in the sons of disobedience. This is the one who's behind the rebellion against God. The truth is, that there was nothing in us that deserved saving. Paul goes on in verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of, of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We all lived according, he says, to the passions of our flesh. Our energies were focused on fulfilling the desires of our bodies and our minds. I mean, all you have to do is spend a few minutes watching TV or a few minutes online, and it's very easy to see how focused on chasing pleasure and comfort the world is. Even the so-called good things that sinners do apart from Jesus is ultimately motivated by a selfish desire to satisfy their body or mind. We were that way too. In fact, it is even possible outwardly to follow God's commands in order to satisfy ourselves rather than Him. I mean, that's what the Pharisees did, right? Many people are in church every week out of a desire for attention or to feel good about themselves. In other cases, that same selfishness is expressed as an intense focus on obedience through the flesh. In either case, however, the root is an underestimation of sin's power, the gravity of the situation, and of God's holiness, the gravity of the standard. The truth is that working to earn salvation is impossible, and it's also unnecessary. Salvation cannot be earned. It cannot be earned. But God offers it freely in Jesus Christ. That offer goes out every day to the whole world. But even so, God must draw us or we would never come. That's the deadness. The natural impulse of every sinner is to avoid submitting to God so that we may continue to satisfy the passions of the flesh. And this is who we all are apart from grace. If God doesn't do a work in our heart, then everything that we do is designed to carry out some desire of our body and our mind. Apart from grace, that's all anybody does. That's all anybody can do. But the Bible says that is sin, and those who do this it says, are by nature children of wrath. Children of wrath. What a terrifying phrase that is. Have you ever thought about that? That was every one of us. And if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's you. It's you. 
That sounds really hard. It sounds really harsh. But apart from faith in God, the only possible motivation for anything we do is to satisfy ourselves, to put ourselves at the center of the universe. And we try to soften this up by pointing to what everybody does. You hear that? Well, everybody does that. Or saying it's only natural that people would do that. But listen, what the, the Bible says that what is natural and what everybody does leads to judgment and the wrath of God. Everything that comes from us naturally leads ultimately to destruction. Apart from grace, we are unwilling and unable to please God. We're spiritually dead. And this is a truth that runs throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Psalm 14, 2 and 3 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do what? Nothing. And again in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In Romans 8, 7 through 8, Paul says, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, Indeed, it cannot. And then he says as plainly as you could say it, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And in John 3, 6, Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So they cannot please God. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. On that final day, when believers stand before the Lord, waiting to enter heaven, there will be nobody there who points to anything other than the grace and love of God that resulted in them being there. Even the great apostle Paul says of himself in Romans 7, 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. So Paul's observation in verse 3, this harsh observation in verse 3 of our main passage is actually typical of the way the Bible talks about the conditions of sinners apart from God. It's grace. We are dead in sin and completely unable to do anything to please God. But then Paul goes on in verse 4 to share what may be the most beautiful words ever written. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Amen. This is why uh, the message that we proclaim is called the gospel. The word gospel is an old English word that means good news. And this is the best news ever. We were dead in sin. We were headed for hell. But God did something about it. He's the one who initiated the change. Why did he do it? Because he is rich in mercy and great in love. Is he responding to anything in us? No. Paul is careful to be sure that we recognize that by telling us that God did this 
even when we were dead. And then just to make sure that we didn't miss the point, he interjects, by grace you have been saved. The word grace means undeserved favor. Something we receive not because of our goodness, but because of the goodness of another. <clears throat> Paul rules out the idea that God is responding to or cooperating with the sinner. Through Paul, the Holy Spirit is teaching sola gratia. By grace alone we're made alive in Christ and seated with Him in heavenly places. We do not deserve this. But God showed mercy and loved us. Why does he do all of this? Well, look at verse 7. <clears throat> so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now listen, the punishment of sinners brings glory to God. Glorifies him for being righteous and just. He could have just left us to be punished as we deserved and he would still be good and still be glorified. But he brings additional glory to himself by adding to that mercy and grace. God saves and he receives the glory. It's like a musician who built an amazing violin designed to play the most beautiful music that he had written. But along came an enemy who wanted to steal his glory, and so he broke the instrument so that it could no longer stay in tune. So now every note that was played was dissonant and harsh, and it was no longer suitable for what it was intended for. Nobody would blame that musician for discarding that instrument in order to maintain his musical standards. But suppose that instead of throwing it away, even though it cost more than it was worth, he lovingly restored it so that it would play again the beautiful music for which it was created. Wouldn't that reflect his love and devotion even more? Wouldn't that bring him even more glory? That's the way it is with us. The Roman church in Luther's day and, and today acknowledges that God must give grace, but they teach that God is responding to us in giving that grace. They deny that sinners are saved by grace alone. Rome agrees that nobody possesses what they call strict merit. Strict merit is like wages. Um, it's like something that's earned or, or deserved. Uh, they agree that no no sinner has earned God's favor in the sense that they're owed salvation. Rome agrees with that. But they still insist that the sinner cooperates in receiving this initial grace. Paragraph 1993 of the Catechism of the Roman Church says the following. Justification establishes cooperation between God's grace and man's freedom. On man's part, it is expressed by the assent of faith to the word of God, which invites him to conversion. And in the cooperation of charity with the prompting of the Holy Spirit who proceeds, meaning goes before, and preserves his ascent. When God touches man's heart through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, man himself is not inactive while receiving that inspiration since he could reject it. And yet without God's grace, he cannot by his own free will move himself toward justice in God's sight. So, that's a little technical, but Rome does not teach a purely works-based salvation. That's not what the Reformers were arguing about, with them about. What they teach is that the sinner does what they can, and God helps provide what they cannot. The sinner is said to be active and cooperative. Well, listen. I've never seen an active dead person or a very cooperative corpse. Rome says sinners have free will and cooperate. Ephesians says they are dead and controlled by the spirit of disobedience. And again, this isn't just a Catholic issue. 
It is the temptation of every one of us sinners to think that we contribute something, that there must be something we bring, something we contribute, even if just our agreement with it that helps to save us just a little bit. It's like a kid who's just so excited to go, and I helped, when they really didn't do anything. It's the most unnatural thing to accept that there is nothing in us worth saving. That is hard. We think very highly of ourselves, and so it's really hard for us to say, yeah, I'm worthless. There was nothing in me worth saving. Understanding that, though, is the first step in truly understanding the grace of the gospel. This is Paul's point in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul says that our salvation is all of grace and not based on anything in us, but by grace through faith. Now you might be thinking, okay, but at least we believed, right? That's true. We must believe. God doesn't believe for us. We have to believe. But what does the Bible say about that faith? Look at what Paul says about that. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. We are saved by grace, and the way that this grace saves us is through faith. So Paul's teaching. So what Paul is saying is that the faith we possess, the faith by which we justify our faith, comes to us as a gift from God. God first does something in our hearts, apart from our cooperation, apart from our free will, that we often call regeneration or being born again. He does something, and the result of that new birth is faith. Those who are united to Jesus Christ through faith have that ability by the grace of God. Why do some come and some don't? You just have to praise God for those who do. That ability doesn't originate with us. Sola gratia means that when we were spiritually dead, God acted first, giving us a new heart and spiritual life and a desire for Him, drawing us. We cannot take the credit for it because it's all a work of God blessing us with everything we needed to bring us to salvation through our faith. You know, I, I often hear that God helps those who help themselves. But that's not what the Bible teaches about salvation. The Bible teaches that God helps those who were helpless. God helps those who do not desire help. God helps those who do not deserve to be helped. And I hear preachers tell people, give your life to Christ. Let's be honest. Why would Jesus want my life? Because apart from him, there's nothing in my life worth having. Jesus didn't come because he wants my life. I had nothing to offer him. In fact, I had no life to give him because I was dead in sin. No. The point is that Jesus came to give me his life. This is why Paul can say in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Listen. (coughs) It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus left the glory of heaven, took on a human nature, and lived that perfect life that we failed to live. He came precisely because our lives were not good enough to be acceptable to God. 
He had no sin of his own, but he was punished, crucified on a cross to pay for the sins of everyone who would ever put their faith in him as their substitute, who would ever take his life in their place. He was born the beloved son who endured the wrath of God so that those who are born children of wrath could be adopted as beloved sons and daughters. He died, and then three days later, he rose again, proving that the sacrifice had been accepted. And now through faith, he invites us all to exchange our lives for the life he offers. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, what a price was paid for our salvation. Standing in the shadow of the cross, what in us could we point to? What in us could we point to that is worth that price? Nothing but grace makes sense of the cross. All of our claims to sufficiency, all of our claims to goodness, the verdict on that is shown by being nailed to that tree. If we were worthy of redemption, the cross wouldn't have been necessary. The cross itself proves that we're accepted by grace alone. There's nothing in us worthy of it. It proves that not only must we repent of our sins, but we must repent of even the good works that we do in the flesh, apart from Him. We are saved not because we are good, but because we are loved. And this truth should motivate us every moment to live with joy and thanksgiving and kindness. And if you are not yet a believer I want you to know it's no coincidence that you are hearing this message. This too is God's grace. God's love is offered to you as well if you forsake any trust in yourself and place your faith in Jesus Christ. I pray he's working on your heart even now. Pressing home this truth that I'm talking about so that you too can receive salvation and peace with God. Well, why is all of this so important? <clears throat> it's important because when we understand sola gratia and we build our prayers and our works and our worship on that truth, it brings greater glory to God. Only God can turn deceitful hearts into hearts that beat with love for him. Only he can do that. And sola gratia means that from start to finish, salvation is of the Lord. It is Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Notice the emphasis of Paul here in verse 9 when he says salvation is not a result of work so that no one may boast. You see, God gets all the glory we have nothing that didn't come from him, so we have nothing to boast about. I once knew a successful businessman who, he had this old beat-up briefcase that he would bring with him anywhere he traveled. Can you imagine how absurd it would be if that briefcase could talk to boast of everything it had done? What would you think? If it told you that it had been all around the world, it had seen the pyramids and the Mona Lisa and the Great Wall of China, would you be impressed? Would you think it earned any of this? Of course not. Everywhere it had gone, it had been carried. Everything it experienced was through the strength of another. Though it had seen the world, it lacked the power to take a single step on its own. Rather than boast, it should be thankful for the love of the one who carried it. And that is how it is with us. If anyone is pleasing to God, 
Praise God, because that's because he first acted in grace. Sola gratia is the objection to any claim that spiritual life comes from any other source other than God's grace alone. And it's only after God gives this new life that and sinners are born again that they can cooperate in any way with God. And even then, the works of faith that we do are themselves a result of that gracious work that God begins in us, so he gets the glory even for those. We can see this clearly in the following verse. Verse 10, what does it say? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are created, recreated, made alive to do good works. Our salvation is brought about by God so that we might glorify Him through blessing others. So I agree with Rome. Good works are necessary. But the spiritual life that leads to them is itself a work of grace alone. We are His workmanship. And He planned these works and specially gifted us so that we would walk in them. These works are rooted in grace. As Paul says in Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yes, we must exercise faith. We must believe in the gospel. Yes, good works and holiness are necessary in the life of believers. They're not dispensable. What sola gratia means is that all of these things are ultimately due to the riches of God's grace. It means, as someone has once said, that the only thing ultimately we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. It means that He is the source of everything good and godly in our lives. He gets all the glory for each step of the way. I'll leave you today with a quote from Martin Luther that I think summarizes it well. Luther said, God has surely promised his grace to the humbled, that is, to those who mourn over and despair of themselves. But a man cannot be thoroughly humbled till he realizes that his salvation is utterly beyond his own powers, counsels, efforts, will, and works, and depends absolutely on the will, counsel, pleasure, and work of another, God alone. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our gracious and Heavenly Father, we just, we can't even begin to fathom the depths of your love and the riches of your grace. But for your grace, we are as much in sin as the worst sinner we know. Let us let go of this clinging to what we did, what we contributed, what we bring, and realize that what you give freely is so much better. And that you didn't give it to us because we were attractive. You didn't give it to us because there was anything in us making an effort that you wanted to help. But purely because of love. Purely to glorify yourself as a merciful God. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to work through us. These good works which you prepared beforehand. That we would show love to others. Share the gospel and that your Holy Spirit would work through your word to graciously draw many more to your glory. So on that final day, there would be voices from every tribe and every tongue and every nation and every neighborhood who lift up praises to your grace, testifying that we are saved because you are good, not us. Help us, Lord, to understand this and to meditate on this as we leave here to go out into our mission field this week. 
We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to the praise of His glory and grace. Amen.